judgment to come. So, like I say, the only we can use is the scripture. And the Bible itself says fear is the beginning. Not that we don't mature or we have great appreciation for the love of God had sent him. He's only got a son, but this fear that Job had would have been those things that led him to be blameless. If somebody may say, some version may say perfect, but he was blameless. He was not a foul of nobody else but Christ. Okay, he was upright, so that his standing before God was that he was in a favorable or a safe condition. Right, and, and you mentioned the fear part, and people are saying, you know, if you love God, why do you fear him? You know, it's not like you're you're shaking at the thought of worshiping him. It's because you fear about what could possibly happen, but you love him so much that you're willing to do what he has commanded or asked of us. And so we we learn about Job. But what is so unusual about Job right now? He was wealthy. He was wealthy. His and was seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred she asses, and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. <clears throat> he was. He was. He had prestige. Right and. I would consider somebody with 12 cows pretty wealthy. <laughs> but you see the numbers here, and it's mind-blowing. Yeah. right? He's not just wealthy. He is extremely wealthy. So he has a lot of money, and we know that is the most unusual part about this is because he is so wealthy, yet he didn't let that go to his head. He was still fearing God and keeping his commandments. And we see that about Job. And so <clears throat> a lot of that we get introduced to in the first about five verses about his wealth and his character. And he tried to make sure that he was so good in God, God's eyes that what did he do? What did he offer? In verse 5. <clears throat> he would offer burnt offerings when? When did he offer these? Early in the morning. Early in the morning. And why did he do that? Why did he offer burnt offerings? He was sacrificing to God. He wanted to stay in favor. He wanted to be right in God's sight. And do you suppose he did it early in the morning so he wouldn't be seen in men? Right. And <clears throat> here's the thing about this is he wanted to please God so much that he was willing to offer a lot of these burnt offerings. And you see in... And starting in verse 4, it says his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house. And then in verse 5, you skip over because this is when... Verse 4 just talks about his sons and his daughters being a part of this feast. In verse 5, it says, When the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings. So we see, what did he think about these feasts that his children were having? He was afraid... He was afraid that his sons had cursed God. <clears throat> he was afraid. And that's what we talked about. And it says, For Job said, it, would, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. And Brother Danny and I had a good conversation after services last Wednesday talking about that verse and, and that burnt offerings. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. So what we don't know is, is what they did to sin. Right? We're not told that specifically. We just, it could have been in these feasts, like him and I were talking a little bit about it. And, you know, you can just, the most you can do is just speculate on what was going on. It could have been, you know, that maybe they were drinking. It said they were eating and drinking. We don't know what they were drinking. It could have been something like that. Or it could have just been the fact that he maybe thought maybe he didn't know what was going on. And he could have thought, okay, I just, I want to make sure that, you know, because when he says that my children may have sinned, it could have just been a thing that he didn't know whether they were sinning or not, then maybe he just wanted to be on the safe side. And that's, we had a really good conversation about that. But the thing is, we're not told what's going on, but it's like Job wanted to be so well in God's eyes that he was willing to go above and beyond. And you said working up or waking up early in the morning. How hard is it to wake up really early in the morning? How many of us are grouchy in the mornings when we wake up? You know, it's, it, it, it's really tough, but he wanted to be so favorable in God's eyes that he was still willing to wake up early because he thought that his children had sinned and cursed God in their hearts. 
So Job did it, it says continually, which means more than once. He repeated it. So it happened on way more than one occasion. And so you have to appreciate how much Job loved God. So then we see how much he likes to worship him and how much he wants to please him. So then what comes along starting in verse 6? <clears throat> Satan. Satan. And what, what does Satan want to do? He wanted to test Job. And I mentioned this last week, and somebody approached me about this, and, and I appreciated that because <laughs> this could have been, maybe multiple people were thinking this, but I kept saying that, that God was bragging to Satan. And so I just wanted to say that what I, what I meant by that was he wasn't doing it in arrogance. He was just proud of who Job was. It, 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 he was a proud father. You know, it, it, it's comparable to if if one of you have children and, you know, you make post about them or talk about them to somebody else and maybe consider bragging, but in a, a bragging way that you're proud of them and not in an arrogant way to show others, you know, this is who my son is, but God was just proud of who Job was and what he was doing. And that's what, when we first are introduced to this scene of, of Satan and God here, Satan's just thrown him in the earth. And so that's when God says, have you considered Job? Have you seen how proud I am of him? Have you seen the stuff that he has done? And so Satan likes to test, right? He's this little pest that just doesn't stop. And so what does he say? What does Satan say back to the Lord when the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Satan basically says, does he actually fear you? Or is he doing this because he has been blessed abundantly? That's basically what he's saying here. He said, you take away everything from Job, and he's not going to worship you anymore. And that's kind of where we left off last week was, was that scene right there. And you can, I mean, it has to make you a little bit angry, right? You know, it's like that person who never wants to leave you alone and always wants to get under your skin. And God's proud of Job and Satan goes right along with saying, well you can be proud of him all you want, but he doesn't have all these, you know, if he doesn't have all these blessings on earth, he's not going to worship you anymore. And so, so sad what is... Part, the sad part about it is it works that way in real life. You may have somebody that's supposed to be a new, professing <clears throat> New Testament everything from when we do it. And then the hardships come upon people. And sometimes what Satan said, that is of Satan when we turn on God because we have hardships because that's Satan's expectation. You know what I mean? It's like he expects people to serve God when their things are good. And unfortunately, it's true. Sometimes people you know, have some catastrophic thing happen in their life. And that will be the thing. So it's not what Satan says here doesn't happen, but it, it's not going to happen with Job. But, but it, it does in fact happen, and there's a lesson in it for us, you know, to varying degrees, hardships will come into everybody's lives. Jesus talked about the parable of the soils. You know, sometimes people, persecution because of the word, and they are going to come in. He said that, that's going to be the breaking point for some people. They're not going to be that full soil. So what he's saying here really does happen. We've all probably witnessed where somebody's <coughs> you know, a faithful Christian and you know, somebody else will do our time, they'll say, suck it up, you know, you know, man out there, deal with it. And then something like that befalls them, and the next thing you know, you don't see it anymore. And, and that's, that's unfortunate. But that's something we all have to be wary of because, you know, we try to blame God sometimes for things that happen when that's not right. Right, and <clears throat> you got to think with Satan, you know, with him tempting Adam and Eve, he's been around since the beginning of time. Right? He's been around since Adam and Eve were alive. And so, you got to think he's seen it all as well. So, if this isn't, isn't uncommon for us today to see that, then it probably wasn't uncommon then either. So, you got to think that, you know, he has a little bit of a point here saying you take away that and, and he's not going to worship you anymore. And that's when you see, and you do see a lot of that, right? And I watch a lot of football 
And there's those post-game interviews that every single time they say, well, we're celebrating this win, so now we're going to go thank God. Well, we're going to go pray to God because we won. But how many of them are willing to pray and thank God whether they win or lose? Right? It's, you have to be thanking Him and praying for Him, not only in the good times, but all the time. And that's what we have to be careful of. And, and honestly, all of us probably have witnessed it at some point. Think about two back in verse 5. It says he rose up in the morning to offer these burnt sacrifices. And as we look at our own lives on a personal basis, everybody has to look for themselves. <coughs> when we get up in the morning, do I read the Bible before I read the newspaper? Do I pray to God and talk to him before I talk to him? Pay on the phone or if I have a house that's more than one off the phone or whatever. And I just think that that says a lot about his heart, that he rose up early in the morning to do it. And I think there would be a correlation today. For me, ask myself, what is the first thing I do? Do I do things pertaining to spiritual matters? Do I start my life? And I believe that's seeking God first in my life. I believe that's a demonstration. I just kind of thought about that, that that's some insight in the heart of Job, that he didn't just haphazardly do this when he had time. But he was methodical about it. He premeditated getting up and doing these things. I just think there's a lesson in that. I mean, I didn't mean to back up, but I was just thinking that, uh, you know, that's uh, something for all of us to consider. He, he showed his love. You can show the greatest amount of love for somebody when you give effort, when you give all of your effort. And that's what Job was doing. He rose, and as soon as he woke up early in the morning, this is what he was doing. So... He didn't let all of those earthly blessings get into his head like some people might do, right? Once they get money, they want more. What Job did was <clears throat> he wanted more of God's love and not more of the money. And you see that here because if he was getting greedy, do you think he'd be favorable in God's eyes? No. So what he wanted more of was the love of God. And that's why he did all of this stuff to please him. And you can really appreciate the love that he showed toward God. <clears throat> so we stopped in verse 12. And the last verse we read last week, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. <clears throat> Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, I want you to think for a second. When, when this happens, when God is allowing this, when he tells him, Behold, all that is that he has is in your hand. Do you think God knows what's going to happen? I, I, yeah. <laughs> he knows what's going to happen. He knows, and he's, he's proud of Job. He, he knows how strong Job is. He's favorable in God's eyes. So, he knows exactly what's about to happen. And so, let's find out in verse 13... This is when we see some of the property and the children. So it says in verse 13, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. So we see, verse 13, they were drinking wine. That could have been one of the things that they were doing, and that's why he was probably offering bird offerings. We don't know. Just based on this verse right here, you can probably kind of guess a little bit. Verse 14, And there came a messenger to Job, it said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. <clears throat> and in verse 15, the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So what's, what's going on here? It's begun. It's begun. And why did only one person survive? So he could tell the tale. So he, could, so he knew exactly what was going on. So you have to think that there is a reason for this. Right? There's only one survivor this whole time. He was escaping alone to tell him. <clears throat> so who were these people, by the way? Who were these people? Chaldeans, which I believe are the Babylonians, if I remember right. But I mean, if you're talking, 
Here poses the question who it was that orchestrated this. In 17 here it says the Cal Haley was one of three bands raided the campus. So not sure which specific incident, but they had a part of this. <clears throat> yeah, so these are obviously people like this that are doing stuff like this. Are, are they good people? No. No. And no good person's going to go in there and take stuff and strike down service, right? They're, they're taking the cattle and also killing the servants. So we got a little bit of a messy situation here. <clears throat> in verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. So now we find another scenario of only one person surviving. So we are not, we know that there, there's a reason for this is so they can tell them exactly what's going on. And so I gotta ask you all, when you get this kind of news, what, what's the what's your first reaction? <clears throat> Obviously you're gonna be a little upset and so Job has to be feeling horrible right now. You know, not only one incident, but now he has another incident on his hands. And so it seems like at this point, nothing can go right. And in verse 17, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. <clears throat> so from bad to worse. You know, when it rains, it pours. You have three incidents right here. Only one survivor in each of those. So it says in verse 18, While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. <clears throat> and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. you. You have to feel a lot of the grief here. So he's not only losing his animals, he's, not, he's also losing a whole lot of his servants. And those have to be close people to him, so he's, he has to be grieving their deaths. And then what happens to his children? They're all dead. <clears throat> he loses his servants, loses a lot of his animals, and now he's lost all of his children. When Satan accused him in verse 10 of building a hedge around Job, this proves he doesn't build a hedge around anyone else. We all have free choice. Right, and that, that was Satan's first mistake. Yeah. Well, Satan's first mistake was testing God. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. But the way that he went about it, it's like he was he it's like he was trying to get him to mess up. Right? He was doing everything. He was trying to say hurtful things. You know, he said, You're the one who built this around Job. You're protecting him. That's why he's worshiping you. Not only are you protecting him, but you've given him all of these things. Right, because you see in this, not only does God know what Job's about to do, but he's, he's proving Satan wrong with how Job is going to react. And he's also proving Satan wrong that he's not going to build anything around anybody because he has given us the choice to act upon with ourselves. He's given everybody that choice, and he's showing that to Satan right here. So here's two times that he's messed up already. You can't wait until the day you need strength to endure through things to build that strength. You have to be preemptive. You have to be spiritually. You have to pray. You have to build this up. As I said, almost inevitably, every day's life, catastrophic things happen. And if we wait till the day that we face these things to try to bring out that strength that we haven't already developed, and, you know, the New Testament talks about you know, not God delivering people from things, but helping 
them to endure through trials, and then what does that do? That produce, uh, produces perseverance. <coughs> and obviously, Job didn't wait to the day, but these things happen because, you know, then he would have been weak. He wouldn't have been as strong. So for him to be able to face these things, he had to, uh, and we can see, give some insight into the <coughs> scripture speaking how, what kind of man he was. And the lesson today is be preemptive. Don't, don't wait because if we wait to that day and try to muster the strength, we're probably going to fail. And you think, when you look at a lot of these, you know, you see it in Jesus, you see it in Job, those who are the strongest spiritually in scriptures, you have to think a lot of them are also the strongest mentally. Right? When they're doing this stuff, they're also training their mind. And so you see this. Job is going through a lot right here. And it's only going to take a strong person to get out of this while still worshiping. Look at Jesus. What did he have to endure? He had to, he had to die for us. You know, he went through his trials as well, but his whole life on earth, he was studying and teaching. Right? He built that up and he, you saw how strong he was. Even on his last breath, he said, forgive them. How many of us can do the same thing? He, mentally and spiritually, these guys were strong. And you see, with Job here, and, well, you're about to see, we haven't really seen his reaction yet, but when you lose your children, when you lose almost everything, you've got to think, it's only going to take a strong-minded person to get out of this. Most people in this situation are going to crumble. Because the, this is this is something you don't imagine happening. Right? You know you're going to go through trials, but you have to admit there are some trials that you just never expect to happen until it happens. And this is one of them. He's lost almost everything. <clears throat> exactly. And that's what and that's what we're about to read in verse 20. It says, Then Job arose and tore his, tore his uh, robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. How strong do you have to be for that to happen? I can't imagine. I can't imagine either. You know, all of you have children in here. Could you imagine losing all of them at the same time? That would be rough. Yet, his next, his reaction as he falls on the ground and worships. When you see somebody this strong, who can you compare him to that we talked about a few weeks ago? You think you see a lot of this when you see when you saw Moses and a lot of the things he went through, he was still trying to talk to the Lord. Of, through all of those challenges, when he was hungry, when he was thirsty, when all the others were complaining to him, he still always went to the Lord. Yeah, he was still pleading. You know, he's still asking God to protect the same people who were going against him. Well, Job loses almost everything, and immediately he falls down on his head and worships. He falls on the ground, and <clears throat> this is another example of him giving everything. His first reaction is talking to God. We see how spiritually strong Job is here. Like you could imagine what he's going through, yet this is exactly what he does. Thinking, and we sang the song, so it does pertain to what we're saying. The song is well with my soul. I'm thinking the person that wrote that had a bunch of catastrophic things happen in their life. It was just like you said, my lanes and poor. I don't think it's any one big event, but it was several events, and they sat down and they wrote that song is with my soul. So when we sang that song for edification purposes, it should be well with our soul. We should have that peace that passes all understanding in spite of whatever happens. That's the practical takeaway from all this. <clears throat> and you gotta think, we're not in we're not in Job's head right now, but we we read a lot, you know, Revelation 21 4 in here about what you can expect in heaven. Right? The no tears, no suffering. And you could have thought that maybe Job was actually thinking here and said, I'm losing everything, I'm about to grieve, but I still am blessed with eternal life if I continue to be favorable in God's eyes. And that 
you got to think he had to have felt some sort of assurance there. Because even though he was losing everything on earth, he's going to have everything in eternity. And that's the same thing with us. You know, when we follow God, yes, we're going to have our trials, but when, when that day for us comes, you got to think it's something we can really look forward to no matter what's going on here. we have to realize too and let allow others to realize we've probably heard a lot of people say I feel alone but are we truly ever alone? Never. No. no. And, th and that's exactly what Job knew right here. <clears throat> he lost almost everything but he still knew who was with him all along. He still knew that God blessed him. He still knew <clears throat> who his heavenly father was. And that's exactly the example that we see here with Job. So in verse 21 it says, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So we talked about earlier, how unusual it is, it's not impossible, but how unusual it is for the, for the rich man to be this invested spiritually. <clears throat> now I want you to look at this. How unusual is it for somebody that lose almost everything, yet did not sin or charge God with wrong? <clears throat> Job is a very wise man. Because... Here's what he realized. Yes, he's grieving. Yes, he's going through all this. But why is he not charging God with this? Because he knows what? All good things come from God. Yeah. He knows that only good things come from God. So if this is a trial, who's it coming from? Satan. Satan. Exactly. So why, why would he charge God with this if this wasn't God's doing? Yeah. He knew that. That's why he's not sitting here. Because he knows that this is not God's fault. <clears throat> and I did a lesson a few days ago in Fairmont, you know, the same one that I preached here about a month or two ago about temptation. And a lot of people are tempted to blame God for all their struggles. As much as you hate to see it, it's a thing. We've all seen it. <clears throat> but when we actually look at it, <clears throat> And we read who's actually the one doing all the tempting and who's the one trying to get us to sin. It's Satan. <clears throat> That's exactly why Job is doing what he's doing. He's giving God all the glory because he deserves it. And he knows exactly who is behind us. The, bl the blame doesn't go to God for any struggles that we have or struggles that Job has. <clears throat> Because Satan is the one that says, let me do this. We know it's Satan. You know, Job wasn't there for this conversation, but he knows. And that's how wise he is in this scenario. <clears throat> and don't you think it strengthened his relationship with God here a little bit? Of course. Of course. <clears throat> you have to respect what he's doing here. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So let me ask you a question. When something goes doesn't go your way, or something this this terrible, this horrible scenario here, how many of us would do the same? It, it makes you think. It really does. Because I had to challenge myself reading all this. I'm thinking, man, as much as I would like to sit here and tell everybody up here, it's always easier for us to say, oh, I wouldn't do that. But sometimes it's a little harder when it gets to be that point. And, and I've realized the more I've trusted God, the more I've leaned on God, the more I've studied, 
I realized that that it can be done. You think about, or in my mind, I was at the point about Kevin Yeager, and Kevin's always studying, always trying to get people to come to Christ and stuff. And I perceived him, and I believe him to be a very strong Christian. And somebody like that, if Satan could win them over, it wouldn't just affect like Kevin, it would affect other people. But he was considered a very strong Christian by everybody I know. I guess the point is, you know, Romans says no man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. So somebody that is very strong with this, Job would have had many associates. And if he would have threw in the towel and gave up on God, you know, if they were considering trying to be righteous himself, that might undermine him. But his perseverance through all these things should have served an example. And the same thing is true today. At least for me, when I see people that have been the stalwarts, you know, they've been there all along. You know, if they was to fall, it would be hurt for me if that makes sense. Along with that, let me ask everybody a question here. Have you ever seen your parents mess up? <clears throat> Has anybody ever seen their parents mess up? No one's perfect. Right, no one's perfect. So I think my greatest example is when you think about that, when you think of being a light toward others, my parents are my greatest example to both my all my siblings and I. <clears throat> so if they had an imperfect moment, which is going to happen because they're not perfect, if they had an imperfect moment, it affected all of us. Because that's what we looked at. And we see in Matthew 5, verse 16, letting our light so shine. If we're going to be that light, and you, you, know, you mentioned this, but when you're that light, and if people see you messed up, it will have an effect. Right? When you see that. But <clears throat> that's why we have to keep trying to strengthen our faith. And maybe in those times we mess up, admit our wrongs. You know, repent and change our ways. But what's so sad is Satan went through his family and his friends. Because <clears throat> later we see how they tried to get him to curse God and God. And, and, and he <clears throat> could tell he withstood that too. Yeah, have you ever heard the term, that one really hit close to home? <clears throat> Look what's going on here. He's not just taking everything. He's taking the most valuable things to Job. His children. His children who he kept offering burnt offerings for. He took them. <clears throat> what Satan does, and it's, it is sad, what Satan does is he tries so hard to tempt us that he's going to hit those spots that are close to him. Satan took his second most valuable thing. His first life things, his relationship with God. And the reason I bring that up is Jesus said, if you love father, mother, son, and daughter, even your own life more than me, you're not worthy of me. And I mean, I'm not trying to undermine your point, but my, my point is that these, I guess, have to be the second most valuable thing. And because Jesus said that's going to be the thing that severs some people. It's going to be because maybe pressure from their families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this didn't let him separate itself from God. And that's the lesson for us today. In spite of how much we love our physical relatives or whatever like that, that love for God has to be greater if those things with our relatives is going to separate us from right. our relationship with God. Yeah, and that's what <clears throat> that's what he did. So what he what he tried first was ruining that relationship with God. That didn't change, so he has to take away the next and most important thing. And that's what he's going to do to us too. So that's why we have to be careful because sometimes when he hits those points of weakness within us, he, he's trying to do that because that's going to make it easier for us to have a reaction that we would probably regret later. So we have a lot of good points and I think we only have a minute left, but we just went over chapter one and, and <clears throat> the important stuff that he takes, but... What is he not allowed to do yet? He's not allowed to touch to him. Right? He can take everything from him, but he's not allowed to touch him. And so, I would say that's a good place to, to leave. And then next week, we're going to start, Lord willing, we're going to move on to chapter 2. And 
Chapter 2, he's going to start attacking Job's health. So I appreciate everybody for their comments and, and uh, just being involved in the class. It really makes me understand the scriptures a lot more when everybody is talking about it. So I appreciate that and Lord willing we'll meet again next Wednesday.